Welcome to Zoom In, Zoom Out, where we take an in-depth look at how news from around the world is impacting Taiwan. I'm Sally Jensen. Our planet is changing rapidly. We're seeing record temperatures being broken every single day, not just on land, but in the sea as well. We're seeing more extreme weather events, severe hurricanes, typhoons, heat waves, droughts and floods. And scientists have been raising the alarm for decades about how the Earth's climate and ecosystems are under massive threat and how we're hurtling into the unknown unless we take collective action now. Recent data show record-breaking air and ocean temperatures and record low global sea ice extent. These findings have alarmed many around the world. We're going to be talking to an expert about what these stats mean for humanity. But first, let's take a look at how it's all interconnected. This is the Antarctic, a massive ice sheet at the south pole of our planet. It's about twice the size of Australia. The coloured area you see around it is its sea ice. It floats on top of the water and melts and freezes throughout the year according to the season. But this year, the sea ice extent has been lower than ever recorded. This graph shows Antarctica's sea ice extent in millions of square kilometres. This year, that area has been drastically less than for the same time in previous years, alarming polar scientists. And this graph shows sea ice extent around the world, not just Antarctica. As you can see, for 2023, the amount of global sea ice is far less for this time of year than ever before. Today, we're diving into these graphs showing global sea ice anomalies and what they mean for life as we know it. We're joined by Dr. Ella Gilbert in the UK. Dr. Gilbert is a polar researcher and science communicator specializing in Antarctic climate change. Dr. Gilbert, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So first, can you briefly tell us a bit about yourself and what got you interested in studying the polar regions? Yeah, so I'm a polar climate scientist. I work at the British Antarctic Survey and I was just completely fascinated by the Antarctic and the Arctic from as soon as I kind of learned about them, basically. Basically watching too many David Attenborough documentaries. <laughs> so if we can take a look at these graphs showing the Antarctic sea ice extent anomaly and the global sea ice extent anomaly, can you tell us why many scientists like yourself uh, find these images so shocking? Yeah, so for a very long time, Antarctic sea ice extent was not really a cause for concern. For very many years, it was either changing very little or kind of slightly increasing in some places. Um, but in 2016, that sort of changed. And that was the first year where we saw Antarctic sea ice behaving in a way that looks a little bit more like the Arctic, which is losing ice very rapidly. And ever since then, we've seen much lower sea ice extents in the Antarctic. Uh, for the last seven years or so, it's been pretty low. And in fact, last year was a record low um, and this year seems to be following suit so you can see on the Antarctic graph of sea ice that it's sort of dropping off a cliff and the anomaly which is basically the difference from what is considered normal um, is really really negative which means that we're seeing much less sea ice right now um, than is usual right now it's winter so it should be increasing and it is increasing uh, as the temperatures drop and and the sea ice begins to freeze again but it's just freezing much less than we would expect so these big masses of ice are melting at the poles but What's really the big deal? I mean, what is their role in regulating Earth's climate systems as we know them? So the sea ice in the Arctic and the Antarctic is really, really important. It's a vital part of the way that our climate system, our whole planet, uh, operates. So particularly in the Arctic, we are seeing really dramatic losses and we're already feeling the effects of that, particularly in the northern hemisphere. So sea ice kind of floats on the top of the ocean at the poles and it's really bright and white and it's very reflective. So it acts like a mirror, which means that it reflects incoming solar energy back to space. And that's a really important part of what keeps the polar regions cold. And it also helps to regulate the global climate for our entire planet. So when we start to lose sea ice, it means that we're losing that bright white reflective mirror. 
and when we start to lose sea ice it exposes much darker ocean beneath which amplifies warming and this is a really important reason why the arctic is warming four times faster than the rest of the planet okay so you mentioned that they have this important role of reflecting a lot of sunlight back into outer space uh, could you tell us a little bit about feedback loops and, and why they're so much a worry so feedback loops are kind of a chain of processes whereby you have one thing that leads to another that leads to another and they can either amplify changes or they can dampen and suppress changes. Unfortunately, we're mostly seeing the kind of amplifying feedbacks, which means that the changes that we're seeing in the Arctic and the Antarctic to some extent are being reinforced. So in the Arctic especially, we're seeing uh, sea ice being lost as a result of warming temperatures. That sea ice loss means we're getting less of that kind of reflective mirror effect. So it's exposing dark ocean, which absorbs more energy, which raises temperatures more, which means more sea ice is lost. And it's this kind of self-perpetuating cycle, which means you see much more sea ice loss and much more warming. And as you just mentioned, oceans absorb, uh, you know, a huge amount of the excess heat on the planet, I think around 90%. I took a look at how, at what the consequences of these rising ocean temperatures might be. Daily global average sea surface temperatures are currently higher than ever observed, and this could have catastrophic consequences. Where I'm standing here in Taipei could be underwater by the end of the century. Water expands as it heats up, so as ocean temperatures increase, sea level will rise. Around 230 million people worldwide live within one meter of sea level, so hotter oceans could displace countless communities. There's a potential for speedier melting of Antarctic glacier once water intrudes under the, under the glacier, and, and that would, uh, in the worst case, lead to uh, up to 10 meters of sea level rise by 2300, and that would be, of course, a major disaster worldwide. It's still unknown what exactly the future holds, but the uncertainty is no cause for comfort as human activities make the climate and the oceans ever more unstable. So let's move away from the polar science for a second. Um, we've established that the melting ice caps and ice sheets can mess with the climate and cause sea levels to rise. Um, but what does this mean for ecosystems and habitats and, and species around the world? Well, the loss of sea ice particularly has impacts on climate, but it also impacts ecosystems and humans living in the Arctic. Obviously, there's no one in the Antarctic uh, who depends on sea ice in the way that indigenous communities in the Arctic do, but it can have really far reaching consequences for things like ocean circulation. It can have consequences on ecosystems that are in the Antarctic or the Arctic, but that has far reaching consequences for global fisheries, for example. But it's also really important to remember that sea ice is only one component of the polar system. And we've also got glaciers, we've got ice sheets and ice shelves. And all of these are changing really rapidly too, which has dramatic consequences for sea level rise, for global climate and for oceans. Could you tell us, you know, a lot of people might wonder how will it impact or how is it impacting societies, people living in cities uh, that we can see right now? Well, the effects of climate change are already being felt and the polar regions are really the canary in the coal mine. You know, sea ice loss is one of the most poignant indicators of how quickly and how rapidly we're changing our planet. We're already feeling the effects of extreme weather events, whether they're heat waves or floods or droughts or wildfires. We only have to look at the headlines any day to see that these effects are already impacting people all over the world. As climate continues to change, we are going to see more dramatic effects. Those extreme events will intensify. We'll see more sea level rise from the polar regions, the loss of glaciers and ice sheets especially. And this is going to continue to have very significant impacts on people in cities, but all over the world as well. We are currently living in Taiwan, which is a fairly small island at risk of sea level rise. Can you tell us what the observations that we're seeing in Antarctica might have for uh, small islands like Taiwan? So I live in the UK, which is not as small as Taiwan, but it's also an island state. So we're really also very concerned about sea level rise and things like coastal erosion. 
And we know that the loss of ice from glaciers on land, but also uh, in Greenland and in Antarctica, are already starting to raise global sea levels. We've already seen around 25 centimetres worth of sea level rise in the last uh, few decades and centuries. And while that doesn't sound like very much, it also adds, to, you can also get storm surges, which really add to this. And it means that the waves come crashing much further up the coast when you have storms and that can have really big impacts on things like coastal erosion but also flooding and can cause real damage to, to people's lives and livelihoods uh, where they live near the coasts. Globally uh, about half of the world's population lives near coasts so this isn't just a problem that's restricted to island nations but of course people who live in island nations are much more likely to be concerned about this. Um, we're already seeing lots of loss from the polar regions and unless we do something to stop that it's going to continue. And we know what is causing the climate to change like this and to cause all of these uh, massive anomalies that we see in the graphs. And it's uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But we're so attached to fossil fuels and our ways of life. Uh, so do you think these trends are going to change anytime soon? <laughs> That's a very thorny question. The, the answer is that it has to. The science is very clear. We are not doing enough and we are not doing it quickly enough. If we want to have a safe and habitable planet, like the one that we've enjoyed for the last tens of thousands of years, we have to do something and we have to curb our addiction to fossil fuels. And the other thing to remember is that it's not all about sacrifice. There are so many things to be gained from transitioning to a greener society. We can have green jobs, we can have more stable economies, stable societies. We have so there are so many other benefits that come with reducing fossil fuel emissions, whether that's health, well-being, better air quality, all of these things that come along with a greener society are just there for the taking. So, I mean, going a little deeper perhaps into these kind of actions that we can take, because there are so many different levels of society that action can be taken. And um, a lot of these impacts are not being felt uh, equally around the world, as you've mentioned. Um, so who, who is responsible for taking action and what needs to be done at these different levels of society? To some extent, we're all responsible for taking action. But of course, it should be those with most historical responsibility for causing the problem that take the most of that burden on. So the most industrial countries, for example, I'm in the UK, we have a huge amount of historical responsibility for, for causing climate change. And where I'm sitting, there's not a huge amount of climate impacts being felt in the UK. There are some, but it's the, the, the overwhelming majority of impacts are being felt much further afield and it's on us as you know as a nation at the national level but also internationally to make these sorts of far-reaching changes and it's not just about the little things the individual changes whilst those are important they can be empowering they can make a difference what's really crucial is to make sure that change happens on the big scale so that's governments that's organizations that's uh, institutions and that has to happen in a coordinated way across and within countries Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gilbert, for coming on today's show. Really appreciate your expertise and for helping us understand the, the broader implications of, of your work. This has been Zoom In, Zoom Out. You can find more stories on Taiwan Plus by following us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thank you for watching Taiwan Plus News. For more stories from Taiwan and around the rest of the world, please visit the Taiwan Plus website or follow us on social media. Oh.